the momentum to recharge the civil society uh, to see who we are, who we really are, and who we really are not. I think that is recognized again. So the first, I think the judging from what has been the new, everything is new today. A new day and a new president, new female president. And this new, new female president is not from a political family. You know, there, there's so many magazines, so many journalists analyze it. Asia's new leaders are actually second generation of political family, but she's not. She's from the South, a businessman uh, made in, father was made in Taipei, but in the Feng, Feng, Feng Ga. And uh, she's, she happened to be, I think, one quarter of a Hakka, which I am a Hakka, so I take pride of that too. too. And her grandma, uh, mother's side, is a Taiwan Zhu, so she has a best mixture of Taiwan's ethnic diversity and new president. And she's come from, she worked very hard, she worked very hard. I've observed her. Actually, she happened to be my, my college classmate's sister, younger sister. I think I remember, I saw her at their house in Zhongshan, Sanbei, Zhongshan Beilu, or Linsen Beilu, when she was a high school uh, student. So new president, new female president, and new Congress. The first time the opposition took over the power. And I think that is make Taiwan politics, the domestic policy would definitely change from February 1st when the new AOI was in, is in session. And I think that this is uh, the political service. I think it really makes change. And that will affect on uh, the future of Taiwan's course toward international relations. I think as, we, as I said at the beginning, now in the last eight years, when well, I say that last eight years, because last is what's critical time. And we pay a lot for the eight years. But without the last eight years, I think we could not really charge ourselves. You know, the, the, we are talking about now what has happened. The Sunflower Movement created the November 29 election 2014. And this legacy of November 29 election really made last June and <coughs> January 16. Without the Sunflower Movement, I don't, I, I don't think we could have the November election result. Without the November exam, the people really, this is not bad, it's good. And we did it and we'll do it again. And the reason why the, the Sunflower, because the, under the KMD regain power, did terribly. I think the God gave him the chance. He blew the, he blew the, I think that would make, and then the civil, I observed civil society movement for 30 years. When I was young, and I saw all the, the civil society leader, they were young, and now they are no longer young, but they are still has energized themselves because of my angels, the terrible rule. So really, this is an archival, arrive again, arose again because of this required to do so. So I think this is a civil society momentum and also consciousness and also class because of the, the pro-China without any reason stand, curtle. I think it's the curtle politics make people realize this president is not what we think. This president is not standing for Taiwan. We are not like that. So I think this eight years really a very critical time. And I think of course 2000 and 2008, that's why civil society kind of a stagnant because the formal ally become the government. So give them a chance, give them a time. So there's a Swiss our relations, bitter and Swiss relations. And I think the AUs make Sunflower Movement and before there was anti-monopoly media uh, protests and so on and so forth. And now because of the what is behind it, of course the old civil society leaders was rose again. You know, old soldiers never die, but they never fade away either. They were still here. And the new politics, the now, now slogan is new politics. Well, how we interpret the new politics? I think it will be very clearly interpreted by the new generation politics. Look at the new power, new power party, MP. Uh, the three, the district election, the, the campaign, the, the, the candidate all won. Wang Wotang, Lin Zhuo, 
啊，林长卓 ，Freddy， 嗯，洪世勇 ，They won. They they challenge the a the 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 well established KMT candidate in in New Taipei City and in Taipei City and in Taichung City, and they all won impressively. So this is new politics really taking shape of Taiwan's future. Political landscape. New. When I say young, doesn't mean really physically young. I think the sunflower movement really changed the middle-aged and old people like me. And if we felt that Taiwan's future has a future, a real future, because the young people really、um, develop their own sense of identity. Here, I want to quote, which again. Another popular slogan in today's Taiwan called "Tian Nan Du." Have you heard "Tian Nan Du"? Natural independence. You know, people like us, our fifty, sixty, and onward, you realize that Taiwan should be independent, should be autonomy, should be our own right and has its own history. It's a true struggling because it was taboo. <coughs> so you have to really real real. We we struggling and this is the right thing and then still feel you might commit crime or something. But young people under thirty or twenty five to be independent. Taiwan is not part of China. It's such such a nature. They they wonder why you you why you struggle yourself so much. So I will compare two kind of struggling independence. One is a natural independence. Ah, 天然独挣扎独 You know. Or, or, or I don't know how to use the words. You know, sociology like to use terminology to catch the good meaning. I think we are the 挣扎读 and the young people like you are the 天然读 You know, we I just came back from、uh, from Japan. I think you go to supermarket, 天然 that means wild. It was not raised, was not domesticated. The, the agriculture it is nature. So I think this is the people who behind the new politics, a new generation, are the Tianan Du individuals who were born here, and the world of identity, the source of our national identity, is Taiwan and Taiwan alone. So I think this is really make the Taiwan、uh, make the, the the first this kind of a, I was so the consolidated Taiwan、um, identity. So I think all this really is called consolidate Taiwan identity. And secondly, is rising. If we look at the paradigm shift, rising youth power and become more evident. I think you can see many many young politi political figure what is born. They were not trained to be politician, but somehow they have their political skill, political sense. Out of their sense, this is should be done. Not because I want to calculate to betray our power relations with you. You give me something, I give. No, this is this is something to be done. So I think the 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 sort of a, a use power is coming, has come, has come. I think that is a, a very interesting. And so I think that what does it mean to Taiwan? This election is a new president, new Congress, new airline, and new politics. A new policy again. Another interpretation is not just young. I think have to look at our own business interest. So that's creativity, innovation, in new entrepreneur is very important. Rather than just to earn the easy money and lazy money from PRC. For the eight years, we did not create any new entrepreneurship. No domestic source of innovations. And now it's a time for the DPP government to pay attention to our own domestic market, domestic innovation. I think that is new economy, and new society means you have to pay attention to providing hope, and opportunity, and security for the young generation and beyond, and not just young people. Of course, is more uh, uh, more serious is the job, the, the prospects. Not good for young people. How about middle-aged people too? So I think you have to create new inter new economy to have provide jobs for young. 
and new society, but our pension system has to be reformed. Otherwise, the young generation or younger generation will be burned, will be born very unbearable burden for the future uh, pension system. It's almost going to be bankrupt. So I think this has to be done, reform. So I think this I'm going to should stop very soon here. And with this sea change, I think what impact on Taiwan stand in regional and international politics or regional is we are going to recognize ourselves who are friends, who are not friends. I think it's very clear and that is the US, Taiwan US relation or Taiwan Japan relations, Taiwan India relations should be, will be redirect, refocused because now we know who we are and then our the public willingness, the public mindset can affect the Kanagalan Avenue can go to the president's office, can go to prime minister's office. And in the last eight years, the public understanding, the public awareness did not, was blocked by Kadagalan Avenue. So I think now is the time to change. To, so I think because of that, I think the Taiwan will be focused more and more to develop, I think uh, has been popularly uh, generated and talk, talk about democratic alliance or democratic uh, coalition. I think US, Japan and many other dem democracies in the world should be our allies, should be our friends. So I will put my, my uh, 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 proposition on the table is Taiwan should develop a global strategy. Taiwan belongs to the world, remember, doesn't belong to China. So China policy or the Taiwan-China relations should be framed within this global strategy rather than last eight years. China policy dictate our global view, our global stand. We will not abandon China. We will be working with China, dialoguing with China. This is a little bit. So I think the democratic alliance strategy should be our global uh, strategy because uh, the Taiwan society is ready for that and has been ready. It was blocked by the, K the KMT uh, regime in the last eight years. So thank you very much. I think that is, I hope you said that the Taiwan has changed. Actually, it's not because, not because because of the election changed to Taiwan. I think the Taiwan changed, so that's create the last night's nice election result. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, my comments are going to reflect my perspective as uh, someone who's based in the United States managing a, a program on Taiwan's democracy. And so I, I focus a lot on Taiwan, but I'm in a center that uh, looks at democratic uh, development all around the world. Um, and so I'm going to kind of provide some reflections on what I think um, sets Taiwan apart and uh, both on, on the good side and the bad side. and. Uh, and then I'm going to turn to some of uh, what I see as the next president, president size, um, largest challenges coming into office. Uh, and uh, I'm actually not going to talk about prosperity issues at all. <laughs> I'm going to leave that to uh, the following two panelists. Um, so um, I, first off, I just wanted to um, want to start a really positive note here. Um, Every time I come back and, and see an election in Taiwan, I'm struck by how well run they are. Um, the election yesterday, from the time the polls closed at 4 p.m. until the time the final results were known at about 10 p.m., that's six hours. It's a six hour turnaround. That's astoundingly fast. Um, and the vote counting takes place very smoothly and efficiently. It's transparent. Um, I was actually in Wulai yesterday to observe the counting. Wulai actually has three different legislative district races that they're counting at the same time because there's aborigine races in both the mountains and plains as well as the legislative race. Uh, and they got through those very smoothly. Uh, they got through the party vote quickly and the presidential vote. Uh, 
and I watched the whole thing just standing right there, and, and it was right in the middle of Wulai Lodge, yeah, the, the old Wulai Street. And so everybody, all the tourists walking by, were kind of looking in and watching the count, you know, oh, it's all to you, got another vote. You know, um, this is really uh, a remarkably uh, positive aspect of Taiwan's democracy. Uh, it's uh, from where I sit at, at, at the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law at Stanford, we see a lot of problems in elections around the world. And Taiwan has come a long way from uh, where they were in, say, 1977 with uh, problems with election counting and, and monitoring. Um, so uh, appreciate what you have here. This is a really major achievement, and I think we can often get lost in kind of the, the um, the hubbub and, and not recognize just how good Taiwan does on this aspect. Also, in terms of campaigning, um, Taiwan has a couple democratic peers in the neighborhood, Korea and Japan. Neither one have uh, anywhere near as open campaign laws, uh, as near as vigorous a debate, uh, near as vigorous um, uh, candidate uh, outreach. Um, it's, it's actually illegal to Saudi in Korea, for instance, you can't actually drive down the street and wave at people. You can't hold political rallies for the most part. Um, and so uh, Taiwan has this, this election culture that is really uh, quite inspiring and could be a model, really, I think, for. Uh, I know that may sound funny right now, but um, I, I really do think Taiwan is, in many ways, a model for uh, the rest of East and Southeast Asia in terms of democratic practices, uh, at least around campaign time. Okay. Um, a couple of reflections on the vote itself. Uh, Tsai Ing-wen, the last numbers I, I had, Tsai Ing-wen won 56.12% of the vote, Zhu Lilin won 31.04, and Song Chiyu won 12.84. Um, so, uh, and uh, also I'd note, on a, a less positive note, turnout is way down in this election. Um, the total number of votes was 12.285 million. Um, that's over a million less than what were cast in 2012. So there's a lot of voters, over a million. Uh, the electorate has actually expanded since then. So there's a lot of voters who stayed home this time, who came out last time. And so that does reflect some disillusionment from some, some part of the electorate with the electoral process. Um, I'd note this is also a common pattern across the world among democracies, especially in developed democracies. We see declining uh, participation rates. And so Taiwan, in some ways, you look like a normal democracy. You really are, uh, in some ways, Taiwan is a normal country already in this, in, in this uh, aspect. Um, but it is something to keep an eye on. And it, it, it suggests when we interpret this election, we need to remember there's a, there's a chunk of voters, probably pan-blue voters for the most part, who did not turn out in this election. And they're not gone. They didn't disappear. They just didn't participate in this particular election. Okay. Um, as far as the, as the legislature goes, we have the DPP at 68 seats. Um, that's 11 seats above what they need for a majority. So they have a very comfortable majority in the legislative yen. KMT is down at 35, uh, New Power Party at five, and PFP at three, and then we have two independents. Um, uh, <clears throat> really no other way to put this. This is a, a very historic result for the DPP, especially in the legislative race. Uh, DPP has never come close to capturing the majority. We've got a brand new single, multi, single party majority in the legislature, uh, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, whether the legislature then operates under different rules. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, on the KMT side, this is really, um, it's, it's their worst performance in the presidential race since 2000, um, worst legislative UN performance ever. Um, and I've been struck by the places where the DPP won and KMT lost and vice versa. There were some races that I expected to go to the DPP that did not in central Taiwan. And there were a lot of races in northern Taiwan that I expected the KMT to hold on in, and they went green. Um, Jilong City, for instance, is a really striking result where the former mayor of Taipei actually lost. Um, and uh, so um, uh, one more thing before I kind of draw a broader conclusion about this. Um, the KMT, I think, um, given the wide range of estimates for the, the vote that Zhu Lilin especially would poll relative to Song Chiyu and relative to Tsai, uh, I think he actually may have exceeded very, very low expectations by a little bit. Um, not a lot, but a little bit. Um, yeah, that's not to say that the KMT looks like they're in, in better shape than expected right now. Um, 
they did get a significant share of the party vote, um, but they, their, their internal party organization, I'm sure everybody in the room knows this, is a, is a mess right now. Uh, there's no obvious leader waiting in the wings to rehabilitate the party. Um, there's no, they lost the youth vote by a massive amount. We'll, we, we'll have surveys and polls on this uh, in the next couple of months, and we'll be able to see just how much, but in polls before the election, they were losing five to one in the, in the 20 to 29 age cohort. That's, a, that's just huge, that's devastating. And so they don't really, they haven't had a strategy to connect with young voters. Um, and I think uh, everybody, everybody here is probably aware of that already as well. Um, so um, if I were to give you one major takeaway from this election, I, um, looking at who lost in the legislature and looking at uh, the, the KMT's performance, uh, both in the party list and, and Julie Lynn's performance, um, I'd say this is really a verdict on Ma Yingzhou more than anything. Ma was, uh, had approval ratings uh, below 20% for much of the second term. That's, uh, to put that in American perspective, Richard Nixon had a 24% approval rating when he resigned after Watergate. Um, so Ma was below that for most of the second term. That's, those are not numbers you want to be at uh, as an incumbent leader. Um, and the people who were close to Ma in the legislature, most of them are not going to be in the next legislature. They even, some of them didn't even make it into the primaries or survived the primaries to make it into the general, uh, and others lost on election night. And so. Uh, more so than, than a, a wholehearted endorsement of what the DPP was offering in the for. I think this is really kind of a fundamental rejection of my angel, his leadership and his policies. Um, so let me turn to now uh, the, the issues that Tsai Ing-wen, the president-elect, will have to deal with uh, in the next uh, four years. Um, from my perspective, um, I'm going to highlight five things that I, I think uh, make Taiwan stand out a little bit among young democracies, um, both in good and bad ways. Um, but I'm, I'm going to kind of emphasize the negative here because I think those are the issues that, that Tsai really needs to worry about. Um, the first is actually the way the legislative yuan is organized. Um, so let me... Uh, let me just remind you that Ma Yingzhou actually had a majority, a KMT majority in the legislature for eight years. Um, and he got actually a fairly small percentage of what he wanted to get passed uh, actually through the legislature. Um, I've seen reports, you know, if you, depending on what you call important legislation, he maybe got 20% of what he wanted through. Um, that's where the majority and the president also as the party leader. Okay, So that raises a puzzle. There's, there's at least two possible explanations why that would happen. One is this unity within his own majority coalition. Um, we certainly have that. Um, but the other possibility uh, that the KMT likes to highlight is that there's um, the legislature does not run under strict majority rule. There's actually a cross-party negotiation mechanism that requires each party caucus to go into a room and actually decide what the final legislation will be will look like before it gets voted on. Um, and so that gives every party that's large enough to form a caucus in the legislature a potential veto over policy. Um, and one of the big open questions in my mind is what happens when the legislatures run under different, uh, by a different party? Will the same system continue or will there be new rules that actually streamline things and place a greater, uh, greater authority within the majority party? Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But um, my worry is that Taiwan has operated under this system that is a bit more consensus oriented than I think people realize within the legislature. Um, and that if that system continues, you're going to have the new power party on one end, the PFP and the KMT on the other end, and they all have to agree on something before it actually makes it to the floor to pass. Um, and so you could potentially see a KMT revival by adopting some of the same strategies that the DPP has used against uh, the Ma administration. Um, and so legislative reform, whoever the legislative speaker is, will probably have to decide how to deal with uh, potential filibusters from, from the opposition or filibuster-like actions in the legislature. Um, uh, and Tackling that first, I think, uh, is important because there's a whole host of other issues that are going to alienate certain parts of the legislature. 
perhaps within the KMT, perhaps within the PF, uh, PFP, but also perhaps um, within the new power party. Uh, the DPP is the majority now. They own it. They they take responsibility for everything, and so they're going to have to uh, they're going to have to put forward solutions to a lot of these problems. So one, the economy. Um, un youth unemployment is fairly high. Uh, does the DPP have a clear strategy to increase youth employment, for instance? Uh, Sai is probably going to have to tackle that issue fairly early on. Um, entrepreneurship or job creation uh, through innovation. Um, everybody, I'm in Silicon Valley and we constantly get people coming from countries to observe the successes of Silicon Valley and try to figure out how to replicate it in their own countries. Everybody wants to do that. Very, very few people, if any, are able to do that in their own countries. And so um, it's, it's nice to talk about entrepreneurship and innovation as a strategy, but um, I, it's not clear to me where the follow through is going to be on that and what the, especially the short, the short term results of that kind of policy are. Uh, we're thinking in political terms, you got basically four years before you have to go in front of the electorate again, and you need to actually have a, decor, a demonstrated record of, of progress on these issues. Um, uh, trade and the TPP in particular are an issue that will potentially split not only uh, the new power party from the DPP, but the DPP base is, is split on how to, how to deal with entry into the DPP, uh, or should they approach the TPP. Um, and I, I will defer to, to my colleagues to my left on this um, because this is, um, this is a big issue and uh, it's something that, that will address in a moment. Um, uh, tax policy. Taiwan actually uh, last year, according to an estimate from the American Enterprise Institute, um, government revenues were 12.4% of GDP. That actually put Taiwan below Japan, Korea, and even the Philippines in terms of, of tax revenue as a share of GDP. That's really low. Okay. Um, the fact that Taiwan has this uh, burgeoning pension problem, there's a large set of pension obligations, uh, and you have an aging population, that's going to become a, a larger and larger share of the national budget very soon. And so figuring out how to reform pensions, I know there's conversations in the DPP about this, but uh, you don't have the tax base to support that now as well. And so in addition to rearranging and, and frankly cutting some pension obligations, um, you're probably going to have to raise some taxes as well, raise some new sources of revenue. And of course, anytime you raise taxes, you're going to alienate some constituencies. And if, those, if each one of those constituencies has a veto in the legislature, nothing will change. Um, uh, two more and then I'll shut up. Um, defense budget in Taiwan is at about 2% of GDP. Um, if you're sitting in Washington, D.C. and you're looking at this election, you're paying attention to Taiwan all of a sudden because the DPP is, is coming back into power, and then you see that uh, the U.S. may be obligated to come or may, may uh, in, in fact have to come to Taiwan's aid at some point in a military uh, encounter with the PRC, and then you look at Taiwan's defense spending and it's 2% of GDP, which is half of the U.S. defense expenditure uh, relative to GDP. You wonder why the United States uh, should be carrying all the weight here. And so there, I suspect that one core issue in, in U.S.-Taiwan relations going forward is actually going to be about Taiwan, um, Taiwan devoting more to its own defense. Um, and finally, just very quickly, there's kind of a hidden, I, I would say a hidden policy landmine in the that um, in both energy and broader environmental issues, there's a, a big chunk of the DPP's core base that is opposed to nuclear power and uh, opposed to the kind of traditional developmental state approach to economic growth in Taiwan. Um, there's another component uh, that is not, that is more uh, closer to the KMT's position on both of those things. Um, and in particular, nuclear power if you try to uh, eliminate nuclear power quickly in Taiwan, you're going to have to replace that with something. Um, and it's not clear to me what that would be. Um, potentially natural gas. Uh, then if Taiwan is committing to uh, lowering greenhouse gases, you're going in the wrong direction on that kind of international commitment. And so there's um, at least those five issues, I think, are, are major uh, challenges for the Thai administration. Um, let me end on a good note. Um, 
Tsai does have a large, comfortable majority in the legislative UN. She's got a clear popular mandate. This is about the best scenario she could possibly have going into uh, her presidency. And so she's, she's, on, she's starting out on the right foot. Uh, and um, it's really in her hands to see how this goes. Um, um, so I'll, I'll stop there and um, turn it over to my call. having me. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and finally meet many of the people whose names I know from email exchanges. And uh, uh, Tsai Ingman said last night that celebrate tonight and tomorrow get to work. And one of the major issues that needs to be addressed is defense. Uh, defense slid badly since about 2000. This is not Abiyan's fault. He was confronted with a very hostile legislature and couldn't get a lot of the things through to the extent where, as my colleague just said here a minute ago, there was a lot of concern in Washington. I was a commissioner of the US-China Economic and Security Commission at the time. And one of the other commissioners kept saying to me, um, I have a son of military age. And why should I have my son risk his life in combat for Taiwan if Taiwan isn't doing anything to defend itself? And I would, of course, blame it on the, the KMT legislature, but that didn't make him any happier. The situation was still as he said. So it is, I would argue that uh, it's time to start a, a serious discussion about defense. And, Needless to say, uh, China is always the elephant in the room and will object to anything Taiwan tries to do in defense. I tuned in to CCTV this morning. I was, by the way, a little shocked to see CCTV on my hotel television. And uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I thought, well, I will see what they say about last night's election. And, uh, I had to read it. I actually had to hear what they said on BBC because the entire CCTV was tuned up to Japan is sent a warship into around the Diaoyu Islands, and they followed that up with a report on Japan is deploying its first indigenously developed stealth plane uh, in, in in February, and uh, you would have thought. Pearl Harbor had just happened, uh, and, and, but uh, uh, so uh, they are going to make a fuss and <coughs> count on it. And Tsai Ing-wen, in a very, what I regarded as a, a, a terrific speech last night, she did say, well, we want stability uh, and, and uh, across the, 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 the strait. And the problem with that is, most people define stability as the absence of military hostilities. But in China's mind, stability means there will be no mil uh, military hostility as long as you do everything we say. And meanwhile, they are trying to change the status quo. So therefore, this is going to be a very tricky business. What can Taiwan do? What kind of defense can it mount that is uh, going to uh, forget about it, you know, forget about saying we don't want to do anything to make China mad. Everything will make China mad. <laughs> uh, what you are doing is trying to make China less mad than it sometimes is while still not upsetting the United States that the boat is being rocked. And if I knew how to do this, I would be a very wealthy woman. <laughs> so, I mean, but this is the goal to strive for uh, as you think about these defense questions. And uh, obviously you can express, expect more pressure from the People's Republic of China because I think they had the, the opinion, the correct opinion, 
that with Ma in power, Taiwan was slowly being delivered into the orbit of the People's Republic of China. With Tsai in charge, they're no longer so sure of that, and they're going to think of ways to make her life miserable. Uh, there's a wonderful Chinese expression for that, to give somebody tight shoes to wear. And so you can express this, expect this pressure to come in a variety of different forms. The economic, which is either going to be the carrot or the stick applied from time to time. You know, do what we want and we'll give you preferential, I don't know, preferential entry for fruit or something like that. And don't do what we want and we're going to find pesticide on your fruit as if they don't have any on their own and stop or, or perhaps bull weevils on your fruit. And, and stop importing. So that's the carrot and the stick economically. And then psychologically, as, uh, and I, I really have to give a lot of credit for Cy to bringing this up last night, the uh, humiliation of this 16 year old Miss Joe for simply having a Republic of China flag in her hand, uh, this kind of thing. And back when Abian was inaugurated, a uh, very popular singer uh, gave, uh, sang the inaugural address and did a beautiful job of it. And China said, okay, you know, we're not going to, uh, you're, you're never perform in China. So that's the psychological pressure. And uh, then, of course, there is the military pressure, uh, sending ships into the, the, the strait and uh, uh, shooting rockets and, and, and then, yeah. So uh, it, <laughs> The next question is how much Taiwan wants to spend. And this is very contingent on things that you folks to my left and my right have either already addressed or are going to, what's gonna happen with the economy. Uh, the prognosis for the economy of the entire world, which includes Taiwan, is not great because of the slowdown in the Chinese economy and with 40% of Taiwan's exports going to China, it's especially tough for Taiwan. And uh, the, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the youth unemployment, and as I understand, it's particularly noticeable in the high tech sectors. The, uh, the better you're educated, the less likely you are to find a job. There was an AIE study on that published about a Ago. And so uh, that's that's a big concern. And uh, the next question, I, I mean, I believe Ma promised 2%, but he never quite delivered on it. And uh, how, how, now that you've decided, all right, let's spend 2% or let's spend 2.5%, the next question is, what are we going to spend it on? Uh, are we going to spend it on fewer big ticket items like Aegis cruisers? or uh, destroyers or smaller patrol-like boats. And you obviously know very few sane people want to do either one or the other, but you have to find that sweet spot mix in the middle. And that's another one that's not going to be easy. The uh, many cheaper uh, platforms, as we call them, or the fewer highly capable ones. Now, uh, third question then is, do we produce these things indigenously or do we buy them from abroad? And that's a whole other set of Pandora's box questions. Uh, the uh, US has been traditionally in the last couple of years almost reluctant to sell things. And I've had people in Taiwan say to me, unless we show them we can produce it ourselves, they don't wanna be interested in selling it to us. And your Sun Yat-sen Institute tends to be a great job, but nonetheless, it's hampered by cost. And um, we, uh, the, the, with fewer items, because Taiwan is a small nation, uh, then the unit cost of each item becomes very expensive. So that's a problem that Taiwan is always going to have. 
Plus, there are other countries that are already there with the items to sell, if they will sell. Here, uh, there is some good news. Uh, I was talking with Julia about this earlier, and uh, Admiral Locklear being passed over for a job he wanted so badly that he delayed his retire he asked for delayed retirement. Uh, he wanted to be of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And uh, now, why am I dumping on poor Admiral Locklear here? I have a good reason. And that is, in 2013, he was asked, what is the greatest threat to Asia-Pacific security? And his answer was global warming. Oh my god. And uh, if you think that sounds bad, imagine how they, that, that, uh, that was received in Tokyo because the Japanese, when they're not worried about being entrapped by an alliance with the United States, are worried about being abandoned by an alliance. And they're constantly worried about um, the United States and China making a deal with each other, perhaps a condominium, and they're going to be frozen out. So this didn't go over well. So I, for one, was very happy when Locklear got passed over. And there's some things here I can't really talk about, but so was his staff, because he consistently suppressed information they thought ought to be made public about what the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Okay, now, uh, so what about Japan? Here again, there's some good news. Uh, and that is two years ago, Prime Minister Abe lifted the restriction on Japan being forbidden, it forbade itself. It was a self-imposed restriction on selling military and military-related materials abroad. Uh, and again, that was a very good thing for the Japanese economy because, again, the Japanese make some terrific stuff, but they needed only a few units of it. And when you make a few units of it, the entire R&D cost gets absorbed into those few units. So uh, that was a, a really good idea for, from their point of view, and it has ramifications for Taiwan. Now, the Japanese are even more afraid than Washington that, oh my God, we can't make the Chinese angry. Um, Professor Shell mentioned he just came back from Japan and uh, the Japanese, uh, the people who care more about defense refer to this as uh, doge, do, doge a, a kuto foreign policy. But they're getting over that under Abe. Of course, the next concern is how long Abe is going to last and who, who's going to succeed. But uh, let's bracket that for a moment. Meanwhile, he's in there. He's, unlike Ma Yingzhou, he's got very good popularity uh, or, or rankings. OK, so uh, now uh, we went over to AIT and talked about this problem the other day. Uh, AIT seems pretty upbeat about this. And they said, oh, we're having ongoing and serious discussions with the Chinese government about defense. And then they uh, somebody used the word deep and broad. So OK, they're talking deep and broad and ongoing and serious uh, things. And they made the point that more has been happening that gets reported in the press. And came up with a very interesting thing I did not know about. It's not secret, but that only sales over $50 million get included in congressional no notifications. So in other words, a lot gets sold that doesn't appear. And this recent $1.3 billion arms package uh, has to be looked at because in arms sales, $1.3 billion is chunk change. But it has to be looked at in, in perspective there has been $20 billion in sales since 2008, and most of these items have already been delivered. And I asked, you know, well, what are these? And again, this is public knowledge. These are Apache helicopters and P3C surveillance planes. And a lot of stuff that doesn't will never grab headlines because it has to do with techniques for repairing runways, 
that are getting damaged by Chinese putatively by Chinese bombs. And um, then uh, the AB, F16 AB retrofit, I was one of the people who testified in Congress that, you know, Taiwan is being screwed on this, if you pardon me, in diplomatic language. And even the CD isn't going to do a whole lot of good because this is, as airplanes go, this one is ancient. It's, it's been a good airplane, no question about it. But meanwhile, uh, what Taiwan really needs is F-35s uh, to counter these uh, uh, Chinese stealthy planes. And uh, 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 some people apparently feel that the retrofitted CD is, uh, the retrofitted AB is going to be more capable than the CD. But then again, it hasn't happened yet, so nobody really knows. And I also asked, well, how would this plane do against an F-35 uh, or this J-20 or the follow-on J-30? And again, you know, those are, have not been deployed, so you can't say. And the other big question, or I guess it's several question marks, is the American F-35 has serious problems. And uh, you're, you're smiling, you've heard about some of these. Yeah and uh, not just cost overruns, but a whole bunch of other things. And uh, so do, does the J-20. <coughs> so, uh, and, and you know, if you can't make a J-20, you can't deploy a J-30, uh, that, that, uh, that's for sure. So again, there are a lot of uncertainties here. Uh, the other big item, of course, is the submarines. And obviously this is big ticket. I actually listened to someone who shall be nameless uh, who is an expert on Chinese, uh, on, on, on profits, uh, say, well, you know, if drug dealers in South America can make submarines, so can Taiwan. And he said it to a group of innocent minds at the Formosa Foundation gathering. And I didn't want to stand up and say, you're full of it. Um, but I, I, I used to do submarines for the, for the chief of naval operations, so uh, I don't know a lot about other stuff, but I know about submarines. And I, I didn't want to say anything in front of him, and I went up after, uh, in front of the crowd, and I went up afterwards, and I said, no, that can't be true. You know, what, what, the, what drug dealers produce is semi-submersibles. Uh, they do not produce things that can fire torpedoes. Uh, they don't dive deeply. They don't have to worry about isotherms and, and pressure gauges and, and things like that. They wouldn't give in on it. And then I was getting this, uh, uh, Joey, I'm sure you've had it too. They're their little girl. You know, we big men understand these things and you don't. But honestly, producing a submarine is a really, really, really technologically difficult job. And I, uh, I, I think Taiwan scientists are, are absolutely wonderful, but you don't want to have to invent the wheel on this one. And so since the United States is going to be no help at all, uh, because the United States hasn't made diesel electric submarines in so many decades, I've forgotten. And so who makes good diesel electric submarines? Uh, the Germans make an absolutely wonderful one probably the best in the world. The problem is, uh, years and years ago, they actually let a German shipyard go bankrupt rather than build one for Taiwan, which had the cash up front to pay for it. Uh, but Germany has changed a little, unless it sinks under the weight of refugees. And uh, Mrs. Merkel is not her predecessor. She's a much tougher prime minister. Okay, so uh, there's uh, the, the next the next best submarines, and they're very good, are the Japanese Soryu, the Blue Dragon. And uh, the Japanese really are worried about what goes on with China. I don't expect them to stand up and say tomorrow, please, uh, you know, please consider buying our Blue Dragon submarines. But there's plenty of opportunity to cooperate. <clears throat> on the technological of, of, of this. And then uh, there's borrowing from other countries who have bought foreign 
case. Uh, India, for example, has uh, purchased some very good Russian submarines. And again, the Russians make very good submarines. And uh, I understand that they, they now want to build their own submarine uh, that obviously they're using the, Jap uh, the, the Russian ones as, as a template, not to copy, not to reverse engineer, but as a template. And I also have on good authority that there are Japanese submarine technology experts there. And so uh, the same with Vietnam, which has also bought state-of-the-art Russian submarines and also is not very friendly to China. Okay, now good weapons are only part of the picture. Uh, there are also troop training. And uh, that's something that needs to be worked on. Uh, these short periods of enlistment are no big help in the alternative service. But I understand that now the um, volunteer force is up to 70% of the, of the uh, military. And those are people who will be in for long enough to learn how to work these sophisticated weapons. So uh, that's good. And uh, loyalty, how much do we, does the ROC have a party army? And how much is a government army? A really sticky issue to work on. Uh, uh, last, there is the technology leakage problem. And I know people say, well, you know, those people who go to the mainland uh, and get cushy jobs, they're, 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 they really, they're only old information, don't worry about it, or not serious secrets get sold. But you cannot imagine the, how the, uh, this upsets people in Washington. Why should we sell technology, military technology, to Taiwan if, as PLA officials have bragged, it's going to be in Beijing tomorrow. So, okay, um, this is, uh, to coin a phrase, this is the first step in a long march of 10,000 Li. And, but uh, honestly, the determination and the enthusiasm that I see makes me believe it's possible. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I've been asked to talk about trade. Let me talk first uh, a few words in general about the Taiwan economy. Uh, some good news and some bad news. The good news is most people don't realize how successful Taiwan is as an economy. Um, I always base all my statistics on the CIA World Factbook because they update it frequently. I think it's pretty accurate and um, I want to get some of my tax money back. And it's, it's on the unclassified internet so you can check these figures yourself. Um, first of all, uh, many Taiwanese don't realize that their country in terms of gross domestic product is actually ranks 22 in the world which puts it way ahead of many European and other countries, um, you know, countries like Brazil, that you would think because they're so much bigger, uh, would have bigger economies. But many economists would say that the most important thing is not gross domestic product, but rather per capita uh, GDP. And in that regard, uh, Taiwan ranks 28th in the world, which still puts it way ahead of countries like France against the EU as a whole, Israel, uh, many others. It's worth looking up. Um, the problem is that the percentage of Taiwan's GDP that's dependent on trade, and this comes from the World Bank, which is where the CIA got it, um, is 70.1% of GDP. Now compare that with the United States. The United States percentage of its GDP, which is dependent on exports of goods and services, is only 13.5%. And despite um, the perception that the US economy has now become inextricably linked with that of the PRC economy, uh, in fact, uh, less than 1% uh, 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 
of the 13.5%, only 1% of US GDP at most depends on exports to China. China is far more dependent on the United States rather than the reverse. And the reason people always say, yeah, but they own so much of our debt, uh, that's a good thing. Because one day if we get really ticked at them, we don't have to give it back to them. <laughs> uh, second of all, they do that because that lowers the value of the UN, which keeps their prices lower so they can sell more to us. And of course, their uh, trade surplus with us is huge. So if 70% of your economy depends on exports, and then you know that 40% of your exports, roughly, are going to China and going to Hong Kong, uh, most of what goes to Hong Kong winds up in China, then clearly that's why people have been calling for trade diversification. Now, unfortunately, President Ma, both from my experience when I was at AIT and subsequently, was only interested uh, or principally interested, or spent most of attention on trade with China, along with other issues with China. Um, to give you an example of that, whenever the issue of the TPP came up, his response was always that, well, uh, first we have to get the trade services agreement with China, the goods agreement with China, because that will be a precondition for entering the TPP. Now, at best, you could argue what he was really saying is that China disapproved of Taiwan going into the TPP. Um, it would bully other countries in the TPP from not letting Taiwan enter the TPP. Um, but in fact, the U.S. also can bully countries a little bit in the TPP because we're the big gorilla in the TPP. Uh, and even failing that, suppose Malaysia said absolutely not. Suppose New Zealand said, no, we don't want that. The U.S., if t uh, Taiwan was reaching all the requirements or surpassing them to enter the TPP, there would be nothing holding back Taiwan from getting a bilateral trade deal. Because China is not going to bully the United States into a decision like that. Now, there will be some special interests in the United States which uh, would uh, which would argue against it because they have special interests. But one of the surprises when you look into American business involvement in Taiwan, uh, in China, is how many companies are really not all that successful. Basically, the success for U.S. companies comes down to three major sectors, uh, investment banks, computer companies, and uh, finally food chains, you know, McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken or whatever. <laughs> and a lot of people aren't making that much business. It was reported, for example, uh, not too long ago in the Wall Street Journal, that General Electric, which has 20,000 employees in mainland China um, and is involved in many sectors from, I guess, everything from light bulbs to financial services, insurance, other sectors. The profits GE makes in mainland China are less than the profits it makes in Australia. So um, it's, it's not like uh, the US is really all that dependent on the Chinese economy or that everyone's all that happy. If you look at the 2015 surveys by both the EU Chamber of Commerce and the US Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. surveys are called 80% of U.S. companies are worried about intellect, intellectual property theft. So over 50% are worried about the fact uh, that China seems to uh, give very preferential treatment to uh, state-owned enterprises, and a similar kind of percentage feel that they are picked on uh, as violators of Chinese law as opposed to anyone who owns a Chinese company is not. So that there's discrimination in business. So all of these facts suggest, first of all, that um, actually Taiwan is a more successful economy, but ironically, even though it was Hua Chao and Hong Kong and Taiwan and other overseas Chinese that 
really initiated the Chinese economic miracle uh, through billions of dollars. Some people estimate that Taiwan businessmen put as much as 300 million billion dollars into the Chinese economy. Ironically, now Taiwan is very dependent on Chinese trade, which is why everybody calls uh, and has noted the need for diversification, uh, both not only for obvious economic reasons, as we see as the Chinese economy now weakens, but also for reasons of sovereignty. If you're dependent on just one country, that country can do all sorts of bad things that will make you suffer economically. So, um, the election of Tsai Ing-wen last night certainly means that uh, the DPP is going to be looking for new economic partners. And almost certainly two at the top of the list will be the United States and Japan, both of which Tsai Ing-wen as a candidate visited, and both of which he specifically mentioned last night and thanked, which I was surprised by. Um, and there are other possible, uh, also, uh, partners that have been mentioned in the past. In November, when she did her diplomatic re reception, uh, Tsai Ing-wen also talked about a southbound policy of improving trade with Southeast Asia and also with India. And there are members of the DPP, like Shelby Kim, who takes a keen interest in India. And in fact, India takes a keen interest in Taiwan, which is why now uh, there are several hundred, mostly graduate students from India studying in Taiwan. And a lot of them also studying Chinese and why Tsinghua University, where I work, has set up five English Mandarin language training uh, schools in universities in India and is gonna set up a six with support from the Ministry of Education because the Indians don't want to send their students to mainland China to study Chinese. So there's a natural con congruity um, and complementarity between uh, doing trade with, with what India has to offer and what we need. For example, with the decline in the demography, Taiwan needs is going to need to import labor. And there are a lot of Indian students It has such a huge population who would like to stay here and work once they graduate, which also means that one of the things Taiwan is going to have to think about, there's been some recent changes, is a revision in its labor policy because the tiny Taiwanese population is hollowing out. Um, you have the third lowest uh, fertility rate in the world. It's 0 0.9 currently. Replacement is every woman has 2.1 children. The 0.1 is because some children die childbirth or later on from sickness or whatever. And Taiwan is not gonna have a lot of young people and the big fall off begins next year. So one of the problems that wasn't mentioned that they you're going to face is a labor shortage. Beyond that, it's gonna create economic ripples because there are three things that more young people do. First of all, they support old people through taxes, um, through taking care of them if they're family members. The second thing they do is young people, when they're in their 20s and 30s, they buy a lot of stuff, which gets the economy going. They buy a house, they buy a car, they buy a TV, a second TV, a computer, then computers for their kids. They buy clothes for their kids, they buy toys. And what happens when people get old? They start getting rid of all that stuff because they don't need it. Is there an empty, well, in the U.S. particularly, empty nesters? But the kids leave, and they've got all these things, and they, you begin getting rid of them, but you don't consume as much anymore. You don't travel as much. And the uh, third thing is, of course, young people are needed. They're the vitality of a country. They incubate new companies. They're, as we've seen in the election, they're the the living force that drives a society. They're idealistic. When you get old, you get conservative, unless you begin as a radical. Um, and then maybe you become more radical. But in general, people get older, they've got all the responsibilities, they become conservative. So Taiwan, one of the th good things is I just met earlier in the week, a legislator at large who was elected, um, a DPP person, who's gonna be specifically already runs an incubation center 
to help students develop new companies. It's very important. And some of the other countries with which uh, Taiwan needs to expand its trade. Um, two of the best candidates would be Vietnam and Philippines. Taiwan is already the largest single investor in Vietnam. It also needs to do more with the Philippines. Why? Because for geostrategic reasons, they're the most worried about Chinese power and probably the most willing to sign on. Australia, even though there have been discussions between Taiwan and Australia, Australia now exports 30% of its goods to China. And there are a lot of voices, uh, scholars, so-called scholars like Hugh White has written the China Choice, which basically says the US should get out of Asia and leave it to the Chinese. Um, there's a lot of voices, even the new Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull is a little bit He's got a daughter-in-law who's a mainlander. He's a little bit more, he made a lot of money in China. He's a little bit more worried uh, about getting too close to Taiwan. But in general, uh, that's also the story in uh, some of the other ASEAN countries. They all face the dilemma that they're economically tied in with China, but they feel insecure. And none of them want to become basically uh, uh, tributary states to a new dynastic empire or the Chinese dream as Xi Jinping talks about it. Now it's quite clear from talking to DPP people that DPP people that they plan to try to get into the second round of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and they should try to do that. Um, that will be when everybody's agreed in the first round and that remains to be seen because there are a lot of people in the U.S. Congress who aren't thrilled with the agreement for a lot of wrong reasons, in my view. But in general, one of the things you need to understand about free trade agreements, in general, they do not benefit the United States. We signed one with Korea, and our trade deficit with Korea went up around $400 billion. Now, I was in Korea, and I helped foster the idea this was great for us. That was my job. Um, but in general, it leads to, um, it basically, the countries that gain in a free trade agreement are countries with smaller markets. If Taiwan has free access to the huge market in the United States, it's a great gain um, for Taiwan. If the U.S. has bigger access to Taiwan, not so much. Although realize that Taiwan is now the U.S.'s 10th largest trading partner our eighth largest agricultural market. So we do have a sizable trade, but we also have a deficit with Taiwan. They benefit, you benefit. So, um, but why does the U.S. do free trade agreements? Well, going back to Bretton Woods, you know, when they were planning for the end of World War II, the U.S. made a strategic decision. We're going to lower our tariffs and we're going to let you sell stuff to us so that you can emerge and become prosperous and can be democracies and we have the Marshall Plan in Europe and we get a lot of money to Japan and we in turn we're not going to take over everybody's former colonies no we're not interested in that but we will provide the military force that will preserve the peace and indeed in East Asia um, that's what we did China also prospered from the security and lack of conflict, the lack of an emergence of nuclear weapons in South Korea and Japan. Um, they kept the peace that gave China a chance to become an emerging great power. And just like Taiwanese businessmen in 1989, when uh, actually back then, when we were being criticized, uh, by the government, by Li Dongwei, for not speaking out enough about Tiananmen, all the Taiwanese, I was there. Chinese businessmen, just a Taiwanese businessman rushed in to do business. And you could, in the same language, give technological expertise, investment, and business know-how. And that's what really sparked the growth of China, in my view. So, we're gonna see a change and we're gonna see you know, Tsai Ing-wen sort of skipped the question last night. She said, well, we're going to have to look at our trade policy overall. We're going to have to look at food safety, clearly. 
there's one thing that's going to help. Everybody's talking about the Taiwan election. Um, let me say a few words about the U.S. election because um, on September, uh, November 8th of, ne of this year, we're going to have a U.S. election. And all the candidates, as bad as so many of them are, they all take a relatively unfavorable view of the Chinese mainland. And take a relatively positive view, in some cases very positive view, of Taiwan. So we have the potential of a downturn in relations with China and an uptick in relations with China. One reason is the with Taiwan. We're going to see a um, the Pew survey calculates that over the last four years, U.S. public opinion towards mainland China has declined. So that now, according to the September report, 54% of the American people have an unfavorable view of China. 38% have a favorable view. I think that our favorable view will probably grow. The reasons they cite are the loss of jobs. And while businesses argue we would have lost the jobs anyway because you can find cheaper manufacturing labor elsewhere, I would have said, okay, let's do it in Vietnam, Cambodia, or in Mexico, uh, any number of countries that are not going to present a threat to regional security and also potentially to the United States. Uh, another reason is the trade deficit. People don't like that. Another reason are the cyber attacks. So there's a lot of bad news potentially coming for China, whoever is elected. Uh, Hillary Clinton, who I think is the most likely candidate, um, for the Democratic Party, had a very bad experience in China back in 95. I was there um, for the women's conference, the UN Women's Conference, when the Chinese government, after she gave a fairly, a very critical speech about Chinese human rights and about women, they moved the whole women's conference out to a field where it rained. <laughs> and they walked around in the mud between tents for three days left a bitter taste. Um, <laughs> even though she was the wife of Bill Clinton, the president, she didn't meet or shake hands with him or get her picture taken. Subsequently, she's actually carried on a Twitter war a bit uh, with Xi Jinping because at the UN General Assembly, he announced that he was going to host a conference on women's rights. This followed the arrest of five feminists who had been put in prison and subsequently released. She pointed that out and said, shameless. The response to that in the Chinese media was to call her an old witch, <laughs> among other things. And the Chinese absolutely detest her. They're also feel fearful of the leading candidate who seems sometimes to talk about nothing else for the Republicans, Donald <laughs> Trump. But they won't do much better. The second leading candidate now is Ted Cruz who's basically given the st statements that we will not be bullied by China and no one should be bullied by China. And Mario Rubio, who gave a, a statement, an excellent statement on the day of the meeting between Ma, uh, between Ma and Xi Jinping, uh, who said, okay, well, there was this meeting. I wonder if it was designed to influence the election. But in any case, uh, let's remind China of all these problems. And let's remember our friend Taiwan that we have to show support for. More recently, he made a statement, which I thought might have been going a little bit too far, redefining the Taiwan Relations Act, saying that if Taiwan is attacked, we definitely should defend Taiwan. You know, you'd have to get the rest of the Congress on board for that. But it's a, it's a good instinct, um, I think, if you're somebody who opposes bullies and tyrants and supports democracy. So um, let me just conclude by saying that the biggest obstacle, though, for Taiwan in getting trade, these possible trade agreements with others, is its own, I have to say, provincialism, its own protectionism. One of the biggest areas is agriculture. Less than 2% of Taiwan's GDP depends on agriculture. And yet, half the Taiwanese people will go down fighting before they will let U.S. pork come in. Now, this is silly. What you should just insist is that U.S. pork be labeled. 
U.S. is not saying you have to buy it or eat it, but you have to let it come in. Because if you don't, you're violating international food safety standards because the World Animal Health Organization said that U.S. pork, even if it's got 10 parts per billion of ractopamine residue, is very safe to eat. And you can eat it, and Americans eat it all the time, and nobody I know has ever died of eating meat laced with ractopamine. The other thing is, the people of Taiwan have to recognize, and I did this when I was at AIT, the government didn't like it. I passed out the list of the more than 100 feed additives and other antibiotics and things that are given to livestock here in Taiwan. People seem to think here that all of your food is organic. It is not. <laughs> I also passed out a packet about that thick of all the pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and chemicals that are put on your fruits and vegetables. The fact is, in the modern world, if you're going to get fresh food, fruit and vegetables, even in a favorable economy like this, year-round, you're going to have to use some kind of chemicals on them. It's a fact of modern life. And if you're not, then you're going to pay much higher prices for organic food. So I think there's an educational process that has to take place, and there's also a more realistic attitude that you're going to have to comply with international standards. I say this is a friend of Taiwan. You just can't simply say no, because America has politicians too, and a lot of the most important ones come from rural states which farm and they uh, raise uh, livestock. And you can't go against those people then and expect them to vote for you. So compromise is the name of the FTA. If you get into an FTA with the US, you will benefit. And as I say, you don't have to eat the pork. You just have to let it come in. Um, Time. Thank you. I was, uh, thank you so much for, uh, to our panelists. I was told there are uh, many great um, pork chop bento restaurants around the legislative end. So if you'd like to sample uh, Taiwanese pork, uh, that would be the way to I go. I eat Taiwanese pork all the time. <laughs> <laughs> because there is no American pork. And I like pork. It was about um, the going the south policy with trade, um, because uh, I think both under both camps and DPP administrations, at least they've said they are they are both for uh, signing the TPP and the RCEP and yeah, sure agreements with Europe. So, um, what's uh, elaborate a little bit more about how this uh, south this southern policy is going to play into all that? So, I'll just, if there's anybody you'd like to comment. Well, I think the can deal collapse. That's their fate. Uh, I think I don't think can deal will, will collapse. As long as their party asset there, everybody will cling together, even Wang Jinping will stay there. But, but there's one hope, because of defeated by K, the defeated KMT, they might split. But then the question is, who will inherit the party asset? So I also question there will be split. But so that, therefore, there's a best bet for is for new Congress to pass the party asset law to regulate it. And then there will be a pool KMT. Then maybe once there has a pool KMT, then will be a new bone KMT. So that's good for Taiwan. So if it's a corrupt KMT, let it be. Collab is collapse. And then there will be new party come up. If a new force, new new power, new power can can survive. Why not the new KMT or Taiwanese KMT to come out? But I always say. As long as there is a party asset, there is no such thing called time, the new, the, the Ben Tu Pai, KMT Ben Tu Pai. No, only the Ben Tu Pai, the KMT. All said. So I think if KMT collapse, is it bad for democracy? No. It may be good for the Taiwan democracy. So I think we should take a more liberal stand rather than should, you should have a, a multi party. If you have a many corrupt multi-party, what good is this? So that's my question to the democracy theorist. You know, they want to fall, fall more. Okay. Second is the go south. I think in the way, 
up for the 1992, the Gold House 1.0, 1.1, 1.0. Uh, and then 2004, Chen Shui-bian uh, uh, adopted the uh, Gold House policy 2.2. And now, Tsai Ing-wen want to opt up for the 3.0. It's good, but it had to be serious. I think during 1994, the Dong was more serious than Chen Shui-bian. I followed this suit. So I think that what if DPP is going serious to go south, go further south, India and Southeast Asia? I think it really should be full engine. I think they really make a trade deal with Southeast Asia and they had to prioritize which country you want to go. And then followed by the so-called of a security strategic talk and cultural religious. You know, we have a 50,000 uh, Muslim in Taiwan. And we have so many Indonesia, we have Malaysian uh, Muslim here, who are migrant workers. Why not use this uh, culture? So then you need a cultural exchange with Southeast Asia and with, with the, the, the so-called parliamentarian dialogue with them. So rather than just mark, just talk, and then persuade the Taiwan businessmen to go Southeast Asia, diverse the, the, uh, the China market. I think it had to be serious, not just the you know, um, talk, go south. Um, I am assuming, I'm assuming that Larry Diamond, um, because the way you said he said it, it sounded like an incredibly naive statement, um, but I'm assuming what's behind it is that he wants Taiwan to have a two-party system, and that's the reason he's worried about the collapse of the KMT, and I think this is, um, odd because it seems to me that either the KMT will reform into a party with a platform that's more attractive to more voters or some other party will gain that status. And so what you are in a period is, is in a short period of transformation rather than the death of the two party system. And I'm stupefied you can't see it that way, put it that way. And uh, it could be this this uh, uh, new power, the uh, Should I Lee Young uh, Party, or some other. Uh, I we were at the KMT headquarters the day before the election, and we got a briefing from a very interesting, very thoughtful, lifelong KMT uh, member, saying that essentially he felt the party was doomed because it was the Chinese Kuomintang. And this was Taiwan, and I think there he, more people besides he will take that into consideration. The pivot. Um, certain things have been done. Uh, the uh, uh, Marines are, uh, albeit on a rotating basis, are in Darwin. Uh, the more patrol boats and other ships have been transferred to the Philippines. Uh, personally, I think, militarily speaking, the Philippines is absolutely hopeless. They have never been able to, uh, to, to mount a credible defense. And whenever there's a problem, they come to the United States and say, you know, you, you, you take care of us for us. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it lets you and him fight and we'll hold your coat sort of thing. But, uh, uh, nonetheless, they do deserve a great deal of credit for taking the PRC to the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, which since the PRC has refused to participate, they're going to lose. And, uh, the, 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 in other words, the Philippines is going to win. Uh, and uh, the, uh, there's been uh, the, the uh, uh, Japanese uh, ground self-defense forces uh, have had American training for Marines, uh, there is going to be a contingent on uh, Yonaguni, and uh, that's finally been there's there's the local population is annoyed with that, but it's it's actually going to happen now. Uh, you see increasing cooperation among uh, fostered by the United States, but obviously you want to let these people decide to do it by themselves. India, Vietnam, uh, and Japan, and so 
things are not proceeding as quickly as I would like because the United States cannot seem to get it out of it, it extricate itself from the Middle East, but there has been modest progress. This, uh, I don't know, um, well, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, I agree with uh, Professor Shaw, um, Dr. Shaw, that, you know, the um, there hasn't been a concerted effort. As I said earlier, I think Pre President Ma has been largely focused on China and trade with China to the detriment of, of anything else. They did get trade agreements with two small countries, Singapore and New Zealand, both of which had to get uh, went to China, went to Beijing and got permission ahead of time. And Beijing gave permission also and laid down conditions in, here in Taipei for the nature of those agreements. But for example, Taiwan businessmen are the largest investors in Vietnam. Um, one of the things to make a go south uh, policy work is you've got to stop sending 80 to 90% of overseas Taiwan investment to China. That's where all the investment currently goes. If you put more investment into Southeast Asian countries um, and into India, um, you will create business opportunities for yourself. But if it all goes to China, it becomes self-defeating. But if with a new president who will make a concerted, consistent effort with Southeast Asia, I think more improvement can be made. On the pivot to Asia, my biggest critique was that when it was introduced by Hillary Clinton uh, back in 2011, I guess, in foreign affairs, um, probably drafted by Kurt Campbell, who uh, I think really paid attention to Taiwan, was it didn't mention Taiwan at all. And of course, if you talk to anyone in the US military, Taiwan is critical just as General MacArthur knew in the days of old, that uh, if Taiwan goes and the South China Sea goes, then 85% of all the fuel that goes to Japan, to Korea, to Taiwan, and all of the Southeast Asian states with the exception of Indonesia, which has ports on its south, um, China can halt all that if it wants to. So the pivot has a real reason. I think there are more forces now in the Pacific. A lot of those forces that were in the Middle East have been called back. And um, I think there's also been a toughening of Obama's policies towards China. Um, it's become much more realistic than when he took office, when he hoped that by being nice, he would, it would be reciprocated. It was not. And um, so I, I'm a bit more encouraged about the direction of the pivot. For years, I know when I talked to Pacific Command that they were very upset that there were no freedom of navigation exercises in the Taiwan Strait. Everybody thought it would just be too provocative. There weren't enough in the South China Sea, but now there are, and there are flights now going on. So, uh, and the Australians are doing navigation exercises, although they're not announcing them publicly. So I think there is a movement in the right direction uh, for the pivot to Asia, not only by the United States, but by other friends and partners. So uh, I guess let me maybe broaden that question a little bit. What is, what is your take on sort of a, a arms race in Asia if uh, tensions between the US and China continues to rise um, because that unstabilized the region. So um, I'm going to just have the panelists answer those real quick and then um, we'll wrap it up for, for the formal part of the deck. Can I say that in my view, if China um, incorporated Taiwan and also controls the South China Sea, I think it's almost certain that Taiwan, uh, sorry, that uh, Japan and South Korea would quickly produce their own nuclear weapons as a strategic deterrent. And that's my own view. I, you know, I don't know if that's true, it's just my gut feeling. I feel that that would be, you know, John Mearsheimer, the re uh, realist who wrote an essay, Bye Bye Taiwan, he basically uh, derived all of Taiwan's current strategic problems from the fact that they were stopped, Taiwan was stopped from developing a nuclear weapon. 
Because that's the ultimate deterrent. Of course, that's exactly the strategy of uh, uh, Kim Jong-un in North Korea, um, who cites the fact that when Libya gave up their, their proposed nuclear weapons, um, he fell. Um, so it's an ultimate guarantee of your own security if you don't want to become a tributary state. And if you look at old maps of Chinese, uh, China dynasties, not only did they they usually have as part of their territory the top half of the Vietnam Peninsula. They also had the top half of the Korean Peninsula, and they exercised control, political control over the rest. So if you want to avoid that, you know, that would be one of the nightmare scenarios. There might well be nuclear proliferation as the ultimate guarantee of, of sovereignty. I mean, uh, and, you know, these countries are so technologically developed. I once asked, uh, for example, a Japanese diplomat, um, well, I suppose in a couple of months you could have a nuclear weapon. And he said, yeah, I suppose it might take that long, but I kind of doubt it. <laughs> um, is uh, any of the other? Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to let. Uh, okay. Um, there are always a different consideration when you cast a vote for president for the nation or for your local uh, ly or county. It's different consideration. And actually, Thai carry carries 18 out of 22 county and cities, and Zhu four. And out of four is Hualien, Taitung, and Jinmen, Mazu. KMD won the presidential election. But in Hualien, Taitung, DPP won the Congress. So, and then, yeah, but the Miaoli and Nantou, Tsai Ing-wen won, but lost to the uh, Congress, the late LY. So I think consideration is different. You have to examine the, the local party affiliation, party inclination. And Miaoli is a, it's a very difficult, even though it's a Hakka. Uh, Vote. And very conservative in a way, conservative and party has the blue has a very stronghold there. And they try very hard, but still. And Nanto Wu Yi was a stronghold for the Wu Yi. And then, but it's very interesting, Huali and Taidong all fall, 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 fall into the uh, DPP uh, out for the first time. So I think the consideration, the, the, uh, for example, uh, Xiao Mei Qin became shot. Worked very hard for AE six years there. And it's the same pattern that follow Lin, Lin, Lin Jialong in Taichung. You have to work hard to show your face, to show you are you will work for them. And the Taichung, Liu, Mr. Liu, and he used to be a judge or prosecutor, and he worked very hard there too. So I think the differentiation, uh, the local politics. So I, I want to uh, respond briefly to Daniel's comments, and uh, because I'm uh, Larry Diamond is my direct boss, I'm contractually obligated to defend him a little bit. Um, so I actually I, I share Larry's worry about a collapse of the KMT. I don't think ultimately that would be good for Taiwan's democracy, um, and the reasons are twofold. Number one, uh, I'm just coming at this from a very comparative politics perspective. Um, if we look around the world, countries that have uh, very, very institutionalized party systems, young democracies especially, do a better job on all of the indicators of democracy over the long run than ones that do not have highly institutionalized party systems. So if you see a lot of party collapses, a lot of uh, weak party identification, uh, no differentiation between parties on key policy issues, um, those uh, tend to be associated with worse political outcomes on, on any kind of measure that you come up with. Um, so, so that uh, if, a, if the KMT collapses, you're going to have more party instability in Taiwan. And so that's part of my worry. Uh, the second is um, I wouldn't say there's a, a, a worry about uh, having a, or a, a normative judgment that a two-party system is best for Taiwan. But I do think uh, we can make a strong argument that an alternative coalition that could replace the DPP and be a clear alternative to the DPP is a good thing for Taiwan. Um, and the reason, again, is from comparative perspective, if you have clear alternating coalitions, you tend to get better outcomes on policy issues. Um, the My kind of worst case scenario is that um, 
you know, the KMT collapses and there's nobody who kind of fills that void in the political spectrum, um, you have a, a similar kind of descent into a dominant party system like South Africa has had, um, where the ANC now has been in power since 1994. Um, and uh, they've gone through a kind of descent into increasing venality and corruption and confidence there. Uh, because there's no one else around to challenge them and, and uh, that can make a credible case that they will do better. Um, and so uh, for both of those reasons, I think the KMT's, uh, KMT's future is actually pretty important uh, to Taiwan's democratic future as well. Um, whether that will happen or not, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, we're the day after the election. We'll see what happens uh, in, in terms of KMT reform. Uh, but I would note that there's a large section of the electorate that did not vote for Tsai Ing-wen last night. It's about 44% uh, of the electorate that did not vote for Tsai ing -wen. So there's still a large section of the electorate that is looking for an alternative to a DPP government. Um, and uh, I would also suggest this is probably a high point. Um, and so there's going to be, Tsai is inevitably going to disillusion some erstwhile supporters. Um, and so uh, the DPP, if they are able to deliver on a lot of their mandates, a lot of their promises, I think will will, uh, will be in a position to continue. Uh, if they do not, I think the KMT will have an opening. I'm not saying they will, but I think they will have an opening to rejuvenate the party and form a credible alternative again four or eight years down the line. Um, so I'll leave it at that.